Hey, this is Bay, and today, today we're back to talking about lore. And if you are new to the channel, first of all, hi, welcome. This is also what happens on the channel, and you may not know that you've signed up for this, but we also talk a little bit about the lore of the game while we draw a specimen of the race that we are talking about. And today's fine specimen is our very own Void Scent Potato Queen, who has changed her username slightly, but to me, you will ever remain a queen. And while we draw her, let's have a look at some of the massive lore that has been put into the game about the smallest race. Well, at the very least, smallest physically? Because in personality power range and the amount of lore that is about it, it is anything but diminutive. But Lalafell are Eorzea's dwarf and gnome-like race, and on average it is 35 ilms high, which is 35 inches high. They have very keen senses, great reflexes, and a natural aptitude for magic, as well as a natural drive for gaining power, or wealth, or both. There are two clans of Lalafell that are playable in the game, the Dunesfolk and the Plainsfolk, and they differ slightly in their biology and how they have adapted to the environments. As far as we can track them, Lalafell came from the Southern Sea Isles, which is described to be an area with countless little islets in the equatorial realm of Hydaelyn. It is described as being warm and pleasant climate, and this was where the Lalafell lived off the land in an agricultural society, where they sailed between the islands in their catamaran ships, which are described to be unique to their kind. Later on, they expanded their trade routes and they found Eorzea, they arrived at Vilbrand in the 5th Astral Era, where they colonized the island and built Nim, as well as right on the other side of the strait between Vilbrand and Aldenard in the lowlands of Yafem, where they founded Mahak. I will happily make a video on either or both of these cultures, if anyone should happen to be interested, but for the sake of this video, let's just say that there is such a thing as too much magic, and when both of these project cities went belly up by the end of the Sixth Umbral Calamity, well, the Nimi and Lalafels, whoever was left, sailed back to the Southern Sea Isles, and then later on some of them returned to Vilbrand because they were lured in by hearing that there were cheap wares in this new founded pirate nation, and they became the Plainsfolk. And the Mahaki ones, the few that survived the flood, they wandered around for a while before eventually settling in the 700th of the 6th Astral Era in Fanalan, and they became the Dunes folk. They have some of the most sensitive and likely best ears in the game, being very good at picking up faint noises. It is suspected that this may have been needed because they needed these very keen senses in order to survive. Lalafell may seem a bit childlike to most of us, and they are also described to have a youthful appearance by the law books, where they describe that it can be very hard for people outside of the Lalafellian race to really get the proper age of some of these small popotos. The Lalafell dislike the cold, and they are rarely seen near cold areas, stated to not go near places like Kerfas if it can be helped, and especially not today when the place is frozen over. Maybe for this reason, if you see a Lalafell, they are most likely wearing several layers of loose-fitting clothes. Lalafell love to dress traditionally, and a traditional part of their garb seems to be a scarf. Scarves can be used for many useful things, and for a race that has a tendency to venture into the desert or the sea, where their small stature can make it really hard to call for help, it can be super smart to wear a scarf that will make for an excellent emergency flag. Other than that, they seem to prefer relaxing clothes that also flatter or hide their somewhat round shape. We see quite a few Lalafell in the game, and as you've probably noticed, some of them have large families, or even adoptive families, that they value very much. But even though they place a lot of importance on family and blood ties, they are far from insular or cold to strangers. 
The Lalafell are bubbly and welcoming by nature, and they are used to sharing profitable relations with other races, and are generally able to get along with just about anyone. Now, this does not mean that they are handing out wealth to any outgroup by any means, but it does mean that Alalafell will generally see new people as a prospect for mutual prosperous relations and deals. They are very business-minded people, and this can come across as being greedy, but it is stated that few can really bring themselves to truly hate Alalafell. And it is rare for this reason that some are persecuted. I will say though, the game servers some good examples where I am literally cheering and squeeing through the entire sequence, so yeah. Good on you, Rauban. I was with you all the time, man. One of the things that immediately stands out when you meet a Lalafell, aside of their height, which is, well, it isn't, um, but that would be their names. Like with the Mikote, there are several interesting nuances to the names. You no doubt have seen some Lalafell names around and wondered if there is rhyme or reason to them, and there is both rhyme and reason to them, so let's break down the rules behind the names. And this kinda hurt my brain a little bit when I tried to figure it out, but yeah, I've, I've tried to, to work this out, so here we go. Okay, so first of all, the names are made up by a given name, and when you become an adult, you get what they call a courtesy name. It is not a family name, it is a unique name for this individual. Now, if you take a name like, for instance, Alka Solka, then Solka is not a surname as such. It is certainly not a family name, but it is a given name that is unique to this individual. Most names take their root in old songs and poems, and they love their alliterations too. Rhyme, rhythm, and repetition. For the plainsfolk males, the rhyme goes A, B, C, B. The A and the C phonemes do not have to rhyme, and these phonemes are likely one or two syllables. So with that logic, you get names like Teleji Aleleji, Alka, Solka, and Payo, Rayo. Now, the males will generally opt for saying their full names rather than just the first or the last name alone, so Teleji Alaleji will call himself Teleji Alaleji instead of Teleji. What other people do is up to them. So that was the plainsfolk males, but the plainsfolk females, their rhyme goes A B B A B. Now, these phonemes are always one syllable, usually a single consonant paired with a vowel, or it might just be a vowel. So you have things like shatoto shato, ekoko eko, and pototo poto. <laughs> I am sorry, these are just kind of adorable. For the dunes folk, the naming convention for the males goes a a b c c b where the A and the C phonemes are one syllable and the B generally two. The A and the C phonemes may rhyme, but they don't have to. So with this, you will get such names as Papalimo, Totolimo, Kokobuki, Lolobuki, Lolorito, Nanarito. For the females, the pattern is A, A, B, A, B and the A and the B phonemes are one syllable, which gives us names like Tataro Taro, Momodi Modi, and Lalai Lai. People of the royal Uldan or Sildian dynasty will then have interjected that into their name, so if, for instance, Nanamo was just a regular dunes folk girl, she would be called Nanamo Nanam <laughs> Nanamo Namo. But since she is of the Old Dynasty, she is Nanamo Ulnamo. If she was of the Sildian Dynasty, she would be Nanamo Silnamo. Their agricultural roots are pretty evident in how they influence the arts that they touch. For instance, in the science of alchemy in Ulda, it is heavily influenced by the Lalafellian herbalism, as well as a little bit of the Mikote occultism which sets it apart from, for instance, the most known schools of alchemy that are from Fonair, which this was built upon. 
They are also thought to have introduced several seeds and specimens to Eosia, like the Lalafelin lentil, the monkey onke, or unfortunately also the mantis, which followed them over when they moved back to Wildbrand. Like most other races, though, they have their own language. But this one is only really spoken in the Southern Sea Isles, seeing how the Lalafell were some of the first to adapt the common tongue of the Hur, because they saw the importance of being able to communicate properly. Because trade. I mean, you can't really negotiate a beneficial deal if you can't communicate, right? As far as I could find, we don't know as much about their language as we did, for instance, with the Rogadin na native tongue, which was inspired by the Old Norse Germanic language. But we do know that, for instance, Monke Onke means friendship and Mahi Mahi means stalwart, which you can find in the fishing guide. However, upon inspection, this ignorant Scandinavian here found out that these are actually Hawaiian names. So I am assuming that the Southern Sea Isles are meant to have an Hawaiian flair too. However, since I don't know that much about that language, I honestly couldn't identify if there were any other words or descriptions that have snuck in that might carry Lalafelin meaning. At any rate, there is this really fun story about how the Ellisons had fought to not adopt the barbaric and primitive language of the Hur, and the Hur had likewise refused to learn how to speak Ellison, for whatever reason, because, I mean, generally the Hur was very adaptable, but I guess they just refused. Maybe the Ellisons were arrogant, I have no idea, but they refused, and both sides refused, and they were at the stalemate, where both parties had decided that they would stick with their own tongue. And then the Lalafels show up, and they, as I quote, had more interest in coin than pride, and so this battle was lost for the Ellisons because they wanted to deal, make deals with the Hur and they adopted their tongue and this was how most of Eorzea started speaking Huron. Which is actually interesting because Huron is a dialect of the old Allegan tongue, just one of many. It's split up after the Allegan Empire fell apart, but in a way it is uniting Aldenard under the same language or similar language to what it was once united under. So that's a little bit of an interesting twist to it. Anyway, the Lalafell that we call Plainsfolk can trace their roots back to those Lalafell that arrived in Limsa for trade. But they also share the naming convention with the Nimians and the Mahaki Lalafell. For instance, Chateau Chateau is a plain folk name because it has the ABBAB -B -B rhyme, suggesting that this is the original naming convention of the Southern Sea Isles Lalafell. The plains folk generally have earthen, grassy colored hair and are generally from around Wilbrand. And some people have speculated that these colors are part of some sort of camouflage to help them blend into the tall grass, which combined with their keen senses of hearing would help them navigate around the worst predators in the skies of their island homes. The Lalafell plains folk actually originated the word for the maelstrom. The reason why it's called that is in this story from The Calamity. So, in order to handle the upcoming flood, the nerdy scholars of Nim calculated how to counteract the flood that was incoming, and they sailed a ship into the Bay of Nim and traced magic geometries to summon a giant whirlpool. Now, this didn't actually stop the flood, but it gave the townspeople a chance to run for the hills like quite literally run for the highest point of Wilbrand. And by their action and sacrifice, some parts of the populations were saved, even if the crashing waves that still came after the flood had been mitigated by the maelstrom still claimed the capital and laid waste to Nim, so that was just rubble when it was all said and done. But it is in honor of those Lalafell soldiers and scholars and strategists that the Grand Company is named the Maelstrom. The Dunes folk have glossy eyes, which is in truth a protective layer of... I honestly don't know what, if it is a membrane, it could also be either, but it is something which will protect their eyes from the glaring sun of the desert. 
This is why it sort of look reflexive or reflective is because it is like sunglasses, I guess. A lot of them also wear a gemstone on their forehead, corresponding to the zodiac sign. So you, if you know your birthstones, I suppose you can tell the name day of the Lalafell. Dunes folk are quite good at spreading around Eorzea for trade and they are a quite common sight and they quite often bring with them beasts of burden to carry all of their wares. Dunes folk are quite prominent in Ulda and they tend to rise to the top, having built the society on values and ways that fall natural for the enterprising Lavafell. There is quite a lot of interesting lore relating to their past and how they secluded themselves in remote outlands after the fall of Mahak, before they ventured into Fanalan, and how they tackled their hubris. But it also belongs to the story that these lessons have slowly begun to be forgotten, like they are, they are slowly deteriorating. When they founded Belladia, they did so with a strong conviction that there should never be black mages again, that this was a really bad idea. We burned ourselves quite literally, and this was a really bad idea to have so much power. Do you remember Karn? The sunken temple of Karn, you know that, that dungeon on your leveling roulette where nobody bothers to do the stone tablet thing because they just speed through it and then just take the fight. Yeah, well that seems to mirror quite accurately what is also kind of going on in society right now for the Lalafellin because back when Karn was built, back in Belladia, which was the civilization they founded after Mark, but before Belladia split into Sildir and Ulda. Back then, you would have to balance the fruit of knowledge with the flame of magic, an imagery that was made to make them never forget to balance power with wisdom. And the Uldans of today have warped this imagery into the flame of might and the gem of prosperity, so... I guess wisdom is out the window. Another thing I really love that makes the dune folk so lovelily messed up is the practice that they feed their children cups of herb tea that is infused with a little bit of snake and scorpion poison just to get the children prepared for what they might face in the world. As such, a lot of dune folk actually have a remarkable resistance to certain poisons. Marriage between dunes folk and plains folk are quite common, and Leti Alaleti is a result of such a union. Uh, don't let it scare you off the concept though, they don't all turn out this way, I promise. Lalafels are known to appreciate food, and quite a few of the people that are mentioned in the lore book have actually outright related food stories written into the bios, like Papa Limo, who is described as having eyes as big as his stomach, who enjoys, in particular, his traditional dark pretzels. Or Lord Lolorito, who is playfully called Chef Spain because of his fine tastes. I guess he's a little bit of a piggy eater. Other than that, I found this adorable. A large woven handbag has a description that says that if a Lala fell fits in it, she will sit in it. And I find this adorable. Adorable. <laughs> also, also, law wise, you can fling a Lalafell. Like, L Rogadin brickmakers of Limsa Lominsa have done this in order to lob the worker over on the other side of the bridge to begin the repairs. So, yeah, as it is stated on the lodestone for Lominsa bridge building, um, Lala lobbing is a thing that you can do. And since, honestly, I can find no better fact to end this on than Lala tossing being an in-game thing, I think I will end this here. I hope that you found something that you might not already know about the small folks of Eosia. Either way, thank you so much for watching and for giving this a shot. If lore was not your cup of tea, then I am impressed that you drank it all, so thank you. If lore is your cup of tea, then I hope you enjoyed it. And I promise I did not put any scorpion or snake venom in it. Really promise. Either way, thank you so much for watching. Take care and have a really wonderful day. Bye.